I'm Jesse McAnally. And I am Andrew DeWolf. And I'm Brianna Jones. And welcome to Musicals with Cheese, the podcast where I try to get Andrew and Brie to like musical theater. And today, we have an extra special guest. A very special guest. Yes, all the way from Canada. We don't get many, many Canadians on the show, sadly enough. Um, today, we are joined by one third of Psychedonic Cast and the creator, writer, editor, everything of Your Movie Sucks on YouTube. It's Adam Johnson. Yay! I made it. Woo! Uh, you made Canada's it. very far away. Yeah. I have to drive like. We, Two and a half hours to get to like <laughs> Seattle. It's so far away. It's ridiculous. Oh my God. And we had you. We had you come all the way to New York. So I mean, yeah. it's... <laughs> my God. Yeah. Um, here live. So, like, you are the reason why we're here today. Um, I suggested this musical, and you agreed to do it. What is this musical that we're talking about today, Adam? Uh, Dancer in the Dark, directed by Lars von Trier. A uh, noted troll human person, a Danish film director who's very interesting. <laughs> and um, yeah, it stars Bjork in like, I think maybe her only acting role ever. Maybe the, maybe she did mm-hmm. like two, but uh, after this one, she took a hiatus. She, uh, she didn't like working on it very much. And uh, apparently she'll be in the new uh, Robert Eggers film, but... <laughs> Oh, and I'm sure we're going to go into, like, the treatment on set and a ton of other things. But right now, Brie, cue the music. If living is seen, I'm holding my breath in wonder, I wonder what happens next. A new world, a new day to see. Dance of the Dark is a musical with music by Bjork and lyrics by Bjork, Lars von Trier, and Sion. Um, uh, the script was written by Lars von Trier as well as directed. It premiered at Cannes on May 17th, 2000 with a wide release the following December. It won the Palme d'Or and Best Actress at Cannes. It was nominated for Best Original Song at the Oscars, where Bjork famously wore the swan dress and laid an egg on the red carpet. It, it was a moment, of, I'm sure. So the plot of Dancer of the Dark is about Selma, a Czech immigrant on the verge of blindness who struggles to make ends meet for herself and her son who inherited the same genetic disorder and will suffer the same fate without an expensive operation. When life gets too difficult, Selma learns to cope through her love of musicals, escaping life's troubles, even if just for a moment by dreaming up little numbers to the rhythmic beats of her surroundings. And that's all I really want to say about that. If you haven't seen the movie, go see it now. I feel like all three of us are going to recommend it to you and just be like, you're, you'll probably yeah, we are going to spoil it. it here. So Yeah, and <laughs> we don't want you to experience this without spoiler. So don't go further. Um, all right, Adam, when did you first watch Dance of the Dark and what drove you into it? Hmm. Um, wow, I guess I was probably like, 15 through 17 one of those ages definitely definitely in that age range uh i was starting to discover some more kind of like weird and out there film this might have uh, films this might have been uh my first von trier i think i think it was the first one I, that i've seen um and yeah it was just shown to me by a friend who uh she had uh i don't know how she had discovered it but yeah shown to me by a friend at the time and uh Thought it was very unique and interesting, very emotionally powerful, uh, very raw and brutal, which I like. So, mm-hmm. so you like a good feel bad movie most days. Yes. Yeah. All right. You and I have that in common because I found this when I was in high school, just turned it on like a big projector screen in my backyard, sat and watched it. And I was like, oh, mm-hmm. that, that was pretty good. And then I watched it like 20 more times over the next few months. It is Strangely, for a two and a half hour movie, it flies by like super quickly. Mm-hmm. And yeah. even if you've never seen a Lars von Trier film before, um, you get the style, the Dogma 95, everything shaky cam style and the immediate like juxtaposition with the musical numbers, even mm-hmm. without like diving into like Antichrist or uh, Melancholia. You kind of get mm-hmm. what this guy's bringing. Yeah. Um, Andrew just watched it yesterday for the first time for this show, and I am super curious yeah. as to his initial reaction. <laughs> well, I made probably the bad choice to watch it with my girlfriend, and and she was very upset about it. It was very, <laughs> very, uh, very powerful. Uh, I actually really enjoyed it, though. I think it's very good, but 
it's like you almost get into like a state of shock after the first time you see it i would say like it was a real downer um i guess we have to get into the plot to explain why but <laughs> basically the whole thing is like they want to gut punch you for two hours uh and they succeed so <laughs> i mean that's a fair enough review of it um it, it, it's fun to show theater kids this because we usually roam in the world of like theater and like the musical theater structure uh, where the most depressing show they've ever seen is Les Mis and then you can just pull this one out. Hey, I've got a musical to show at, at this theater kid party. <laughs> you, you guys think Les Mis is depressing? Let's go. And just yeah. ruin everyone's week. All that performative energy. It kind of is an anti-musical if you really mm. look at it. I mean, structurally, it's kind of sound musical-wise. Like, I know tonally it is, like, yeah, the total anti-musical. But he, Lars von Trier embraces the filmic techniques of, like, the Bubsy Berkeley style and fails in a lot of ways trying to do it, but he does embrace them. And the way that he uses songs does push plot forward in a way that Bubsy Berkeley style musicals didn't at the time. So this mm -hmm. has more in common with like Rodgers and Hammerstein than it does with like the musicals that Selma's obsessed with which were just like let's stop the world for a bit. Yeah although I don't know it took a long time for the first song to even appear in the film which is pretty cool and I, I enjoyed that aspect to it you know if you're walking into it not knowing that it's mm -hmm. a musical kind yeah. of takes you by surprise and i think that's kind of somewhat the purpose of having that delayed song to open things up you know it's even it's it's more jarring mm -hmm. because you don't see it coming because yeah. they don't open up with it yeah the movie I, serves its purpose regardless of whether or not there's music in it before that point and so you think why not mm -hmm. why you know why not just continue things the way that it would go you're not expecting that but it does set you up to expect there to be some kind of musical thing, even though it is diegetic. The opening scene is just a straight Rodgers and Hammerstein like song performance, like mm -hmm. rehearsal in the reality. But it is both setting the stage, like there will be music, like this is a promise. You're gonna, you'll get there. We didn't hire Bjork for no reason, but mm -hmm. you're gonna have to sit through a lot of setup before we get there. So that's what I think that purpose of them singing my favorite things in that opening number as well as just setting up her general tastes mm -hmm. that we're going to subvert later. Yeah, and they point out how she sings weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh. She is not ideal casting choice for Maria. Uh, just just throwing that out there. I don't know what that director mm. was thinking and his frustration he was being has no nice. sympathy for me. <laughs> yeah, he was just being nice, right? That's like yeah. revealed later on. He was just doing it because he knew that she liked musicals a lot yeah. or he felt yeah. bad or something like that. I mean, was... everyone kind of feels bad for Selma in this. I feel like Selma's either idealized by like Peter Stormare or pitied by literally everyone else. Yeah, well, I mean, there's like a lot of empathy that people show her. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of rules that are like bent or broken for her sake because they realize that she's going through tough times, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Andrew, do you want to just break down what the this is all building to in your most direct, blunt terms that I know you'll spit out? Yeah, I mean, I can explain. Yeah. So, I mean, we got the basics of it. Uh, Selma's going blind. Um, she's living in America. She had moved there, and she's living on someone else's property, renting from a uh, police officer and his wife. Um She's saving up money for her son's uh, surgery that he needs. Um, and the police officer, um, basically he's going to lose his house because his wife is spending so much money and he doesn't have his inheritance anymore. So he decides he's going to just steal from this blind woman. Um, and that all leads to a confrontation where, uh, in the heavy spoilers, she kills him uh, and takes the money and then pays for the operation. And then she goes to prison and gets the death sentence and that's kind of the end of the movie it is all just leading into that death sentence and that's the end but then again uh, <laughs> framing wise this is one of the happier Lars von Trier endings because she sets out with this goal and goes through some things that bumps in the road and then achieves it by the end um, she yeah you can call it a happy surgery. ending so <laughs> as far as a musical theater structure is concerned she has her want, she goes through the hero's journey to get that, and she succeeds in getting it, with consequences, yeah. of course, but it is resolution. Yeah, there's very, very heavy consequences that will make you 
uh, not feel very happy by the end. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good ending, I think. It, it is. No, I, I mean, I'm not disagreeing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fantastic, and I didn't do it justice at all. <laughs> you should definitely watch it if you're listening to this. Well, if they're mm -hmm. here at this point, I'm assuming they have watched it, and... From this... Oh, come on. Nobody actually listens to spoiler warnings. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I do, but I am also of the belief that spoilers don't innately ruin a movie. They don't. They. I don't think they do either, but... Um, so, yeah. who, 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 Matt, who cares at this point? So, let's talk about Lars von Trier and his stylistic choices. Um, this is the third part of the trilogy, the Golden Heart trilogy, about, like, women that are sinners and saints at the same time, which is basically like she is this altruistic like woman that is also a murderer, so there's the oxymoron of that. I have not seen the other two in the trilogy, but I know this one was the big finale and the one of the bigger different pieces. Um, and this is different from most of Von Trier's films, if I remember correctly. The only other ones I've seen are Antichrist and Melancholia, and it's just apples and oranges with them but you can still feel the same stylistic choices as well as like the Stellan Skarsgård and Udo Kier of it all. Which uh, which films are in the trilogy because I know Breaking the Waves has to be because uh, that's very similar. Ooh. But then I'm looking online here. I don't know if this is like the and anything official but I'm I'm seeing like that The Idiots is also in the trilogy which I would say that like that's so different. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's doesn't feel like it's a part of the same thing but I don't know. Yeah, apparently it's Breaking the Waves, The Idiots, and Dancer in the Dark are the That's three. That's so weird. Breaking mm. Breaking the Waves is very similar to Dancer in the Dark, but The Idiots is not at all. <laughs> <laughs> is it thematically? I, I haven't seen these either. Well, Is it like thematically similar in any way? The, or is it the just, similarity it's... is that there is a female character that is both a sinner and a saint, um, that both sins and is also saintly in different yeah, ways. Yeah, The which Idiots was... isn't really about that. <laughs> Maybe I should watch it again. It's uh, It's a little different. But maybe that's not how the audience perceives it, but that's how I he saw it. Could, I don't know. You could you could <laughs> take any number of meanings from I guess the idiots or any number of one of Lars von Trier's films, but like I guess particularly the idiots. Um, depending on just how much you bullshit, I guess. You could say it's <laughs> anything. I mean, he also bullshits himself into a corner quite a bit. Um, there is the infamous place where he admits to being a Nazi and understanding Hitler, Classic. where I feel like he had a point and just lost it at a certain point and just said a bunch yeah. of redonkulous stupid things um that, do not confuse that for me defending von Trier. that's just what i interpreted that moment as um i guess we should talk it's a weird about thing to say i guess <laughs> the relationship between bjork and lars von Trier on set of this film which was very contentious very mean mostly because von trier was like she's not an actor so i i just basically bullied her until she was actually feeling the way the character was feeling and then bjork was like no you shouldn't have done that and even like when this was premiering at can and like there were interviews like that was the conversation where they're both on stage where she's like you you should apologize he's like no you're, you did good in the movie i'm not apologizing <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's a true artist. <laughs> and happens. of course, much later, she'd be like, yeah, this Danish filmmaker that will remain on name oh, yeah. despite me being only in one film, really, and he's the only Danish filmmaker who totally abused me. I'm not going to say his <laughs> name, though. I'm not going to yeah. say his name, but yeah, it's definitely this one guy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah, I hope she has better shame. experiences with uh, Robert Eggers. Yes. Yeah, he seems that, nice. that's going to be great. Robert Eager seems like a real, real cool guy, Um, but mm. uh, better than Lars von Trier. Let's just say that, but that's not a hard line to beat, to be honest. Yeah. Um. So I'm often, like, struck by this film and its stylistic choices. Um, Adam, do you want to talk about the Dogma 95 movement and what that was and how its influences are still here? Uh, yeah, so basically Dogma 95 was created by uh, Thomas Vinterberg and I think Lars von Trier were the two that created it. Mm -hmm. um, and basically it was kind of like a, f a film movement where they felt as though uh, movies were losing 
what made them important uh and what should be communicated through writing or characters was instead communicated through things like over usage of music or editing or uh you know film quality or spectacle and so basically it was like a challenge i guess to create films while stripping away as much of the spectacle as possible so in their manifesto uh they listed several rules um some of which included things like uh you can only use natural lighting. Uh, you can't bring in lights from anywhere else. It just has to be whatever lighting is already there. Uh, you can't take audio that isn't being recorded while you're filming. So you can't do like uh, like non-diegetic music or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, and a lot of these rules existed and, you know, you can't credit the director. <coughs> but uh, what's interesting about Dogma 95 is... I don't think there's a single film that follows all the rules, even though they've certified as their organization. They're like, this is dogma number one, and this is dogma number two. And then, you know, Harmony Korine's Julian Donkey Boy, they call the Dogma 95 film. Every, I, I don't think there's a single one that follows all the rules perfectly. Like uh, Thomas Vinterberg later admitted like, yeah, we brought in one light on one day. Yeah, but, you know, the, the, the idea exists uh, of, of trying to create a film where you're not doing anything like showy or flashy and it does have this nice personality to it uh on these like cheaper looking cameras and mm -hmm. um you know it's kind of kind of like uh it, it doesn't look polished and i think that that adds personality to it so dancer in the yeah. dark is not a dogma 95 film uh even them th their organization uh which no longer exists they didn't mm -hmm. consider this one to be um but well, Lars music von Trier had and... always <laughs> Uh, enjoyed doing things kind of in this weird style where he would uh, contrast like really abrasive camera movements and cuts with uh, more uh, stationary uh, and professional camera movements and cuts. One great example would be Antichrist where the contrast between uh, just like the these scenes near the beginning where it's like mostly close-ups and like super shaky mm -hmm. the cuts happen in ways which are just like totally unconventional where it's like you're cutting from one thing to the same thing without you know it, it was it, it's not neat and tightly edited or professional and then you get to the shots in Antichrist where it's like uh, they actually like invented new filming techniques for some of the, like these weird slow-mo and like crazy camera swoop swooping stuff where it's like oh wow so it's not mm -hmm. these other parts weren't done because you weren't talented they were done as an intentional obvious choice so that's right i don't know that's kind of cool and about it. it's also yeah. the juxtaposition scene in melancholia with like the opening very super slow-mo scenes yeah. compared to like the yeah back to dogma 95 style handheld cameras following kirsten dunce around mm -hmm. um but i i liked that you had that in like like comparison between like the very dogma-esque shooting handheld for everything that's not sung and then as soon as it's sung we crank up the saturation 25 percent and we lock down the camera yeah although i would argue um if he had made this film when he had access to the same technology and i guess his own skill level or talent as he did mm -hmm when Antichrist existed, I think that this would have turned out pretty differently. Because although the intent is really obvious in this film with the stationary cameras, and um, I guess also because they involved uh, dance choreography, they wanted to make sure that uh, cuts were more consistent. Like, basically just film it happening once and then use these, like, 500 cameras that they have everywhere, right? <laughs> I feel mm. like they still could have had, like, something that looked, like, more polished. And I guess, like, if you're trying to imitate the genre still, like, I think I think they could have done a better job with it. A lot of the shots seem like way too close still because they're trying to fit as many cameras in there as possible without looking at the other cameras in the frame. Mm -hmm. And so some of it kind of seems yeah. messy, which kind of seems like almost like counterintuitive if you're trying to contrast the messiness of the previous scenes with that. You're going to want, I don't know. It, it feels like he wasn't completely there yet skill level wise to be able to really pull off like a ideal contrast between two filming styles. Yeah, and I think the, the technology doesn't help because the camera quality just doesn't look 
Yeah. Like the the big musical number that he wants it to look like, you know. Yeah, it still looks like really kind of cheap. <laughs> I, I, I mean, yeah, that's that's the way to put it. <laughs> I, I think there's like a, a disparity between like, because sometimes I think he's very good at setting up shots and figuring out where it goes and how to edit them together. Um, and other times it's just bad and like, oh, you just threw 100 cameras here and got what you got. And the, the yeah. latter is the I've seen it all scene on the train where it's just like, oh, I, you didn't really look at what you were getting uh, you just threw cameras down on this train got as much as you could and then called it a day whereas the first with musical the... one sorry i interrupted oh no yeah, worries that, like no clacker worries. crash bang like the 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 shots that i have in my memory are all kind of like shitty looking <laughs> <laughs> they have weird angles like they're like up in the corner yes. of the ceiling like it, it's not how yeah. you would shoot a dance number in any other kind of movie i don't think yeah, but I will say the one that does feel like a dance number that like if just shot with like a little bit of a wider lens at, with the same exact shot composition is the Aldrich Novi uh, courtroom um, dance yeah. number that feels like a properly shot dance number. Maybe it's just because he knew he had Joel Gray on the set who knows his shit and was like, oh, I got got to actually show up to work. I think it was a combination of having the right amount of people and the right amount of space. Mm to film uh the train you know the train sequence was like only two people but like how are you going to shoot that you know like you know you don't have a lot of places to put these cameras and then the uh factory scene was like okay well where are we going to put the cameras here like how much equipment are we going to move around and there's also like a hundred people at the same time it's like it's, yeah I, it, it seemed too chaotic and messy to get something that looked really uh intentional you know yes whereas the courtroom I... is just the perfect balance I think the courtroom is like the best like musical number. I think um, the 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 factory scene is the most effective at like waking you up, and being like, okay, this is what mm -hmm. the movie is. It's chaos and it works. Um, the one that I feel like just doesn't work um, visually for me in any way is, I think it's called Scatterheart. Um, the one right after she murders the police officer, and it's like two people very simplistic but i also feel like i'm s spying on her a as she's singing the song rather than like watching her it's like you're on his uh, indoor security system yes. watching the uh, song <laughs> yes that's kind of what it is i felt like i was watching that that chris watts movie where they're like all in the cops um uh body cam <laughs> I my issues with that song are more along the lines of like the lyricism and the tone uh, and mm -hmm. just how they clash together in weird ways that don't seem like they fit, um, which I mean, like you could say that about a lot of Bjork's musical style in regards yes. to this film being like a musical sort of thing. Um, but this song in particular is one where like it just seems to clash the most for me because like the lyrics and the tone, it's just like maybe you if you had a different tone you could have the lyrics work where it's like i've called the police but like because of because of the tone of the song it's, it's very just like, strange it's, it's so weird because she's not saying it you know you'd want something like a bit more either energetic or you know almost kind of like thrilling in a way or or uh, urgent if for for lines like that where it's like come on hurry but it's like this weird kind of droning like somber i think a lot of the songs are like that but this Sorry. <laughs> I, I i no no that's fine i think the argument for that scene and i could see an argument being made by bjork and lars von Trier being like well we kind of don't want people to mistake this for what's literally happening as many americans will just take oh it's happening in front of me this is what's literally happening so that kind of droning dreamlike speech is like yeah there's no way this is reality <laughs> I don't think that I mean, that's I an, hope. an issue if you change the tone of the song. I, yes. I don't think many people thought that the clacker, crash, bang, whatever, whatever thing was like reality. Um, I'm just saying the lyrics seem to like, the idea. conflict with the tone. It's just a, it seems so weird to put that there. Um, I, I like what the song builds into. I like when the strings come in near the end uh, and she's singing you know, what I had to do or whatever. Like at that moment, then it's like, okay, I'm feeling something emotional. But like for the majority of that song, it's like, this is weird. You know, that's mostly what I'm, I'm thinking. Would it be better if the kid wasn't singing the chorus on his bike that's the entire time? That's goofy. Him just like on the bike. He's like riding circle. his bike in circles singing, He's got his GoPro singing the lyrics. Attached to yeah. It. And it's like the the um the the time signature is just so weirdly atypical and like it's just I don't know. It's just it's it's a bizarre song for like such a such an important moment in the film, you know? 
Mm-hmm. I don't but know. have have you listened to the album version where it's basically oh, no. Bjork, uh, where it's basically Bjork sings every line of that? There's no like cutting away, and it it's like, it's a Later. whole different feel, and it feels a lot more intense. And I'm like, why wasn't this the way it was done in the movie, <laughs> where it's yeah. just all her? <laughs> when I'm hearing like some of the other actors singing in the film, mm-hmm. it's a little not professional peter stormare is is the worst like i I, yeah. I love him he's a great actor but my god he kind of ruins i've seen it all for me yeah it's a weird movie because it's like there's there's so much like obvious production value and effort mm-hmm. and thought put into so much of it but at the same time it's also like kind of a indie mess it's it, they're both ex- <laughs> both of those things existing at once you know <laughs> an indie mess movie, is like the yeah. perfect yeah. perfect description of a great movie I, in my opinion yeah it, a lot of stuff clashes but i think the end result still still works mm-hmm. um I, I i really want to talk about um joel gray in this movie who is in here for five seconds uh, just so i can reel back in the theater fans for a moment um do you know who joel gray is adam no Okay, okay. I, I, this is going to be fun. He is a Broadway actor who also won an Oscar for Cabaret. Um, mm-hmm. He is mostly known for dancing. He's Jennifer Grey's dad, um, just for that. He is one of the best and oldest, like, original Broadway actors to still be, like, working in the business. And just seeing him pop up in this movie and his vocal quality is just so much on a different level that it blends so perfectly with Bjork's, like... It it Mm -hmm. just brings me so much joy every time I get to that moment. Like, it is technically the last happy moment before the movie ends, so... Is it in the uh, courtroom scene? Yes, he plays Aldrich Novi. He's Novi, right? Yeah. 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 So they bring in this big Broadway star to play this big musical star. It is great and was shocking for me the first time I watched it because I was like, mm-hmm. oh, we're just going to get like all all the usual Von Trier favorites. You're going to get the Udo Kiers. You're going to get Stellan Skarsgård, Peter Stormare, like all the people you kind of expect and then out of nowhere here, Joel Grey, what? What? And he just bursts out this big tap m- moment where we get to pay off all the tapping rehearsals we've seen beforehand and just see one knock it out of the park. That is the one scene that feels like a Bubsy Berkeley style musical number with dance mm-hmm. breaks and everything. It's like absurd that the court, they bring in old rich Novi though. Am I the only one thought oh, that yeah, was like it's, absurd? It's weird. <laughs> uh, but it's yeah, like, I think oh, they would have we to found... prove... <laughs> That there's yeah. nobody else with that name. Yes. Yeah, like nobody else exists. Like, I don't know. What if her? What if he actually did have someone named Old Rich Novi, and it's just a coincidence? Like, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> they knew that she was too stupid to defend herself properly. Yeah. So, so they were they were happened. honestly just flexing on her. It, yeah. it was like a it was a gamer moment, you know. Yeah. They leveled up. <laughs> they, leveled up. they yeah. flexed on her. It's like, yeah, we got Aldrich. He's gonna tap on the desk. Mm-hmm. So, Andrew, you brought up troubles you have with the courtroom scene earlier, um, just about, like, logistics. I mean, just logistically, there is a lot the defense could have brought that they just did not. And I know she's lying, and she doesn't want to tell the truth or whatever, but, like, they never find the money, and there's all this, like, romance stuff that they imply, so I feel like they could have got her at least second degree and maybe saved the death penalty. I don't know. They do say... <laughs> Uh, after that, her lawyer was terrible, and they tried to get. They do the say case that. Reopened, so. They do say that, and I I tend to agree, but I don't think her lawyer even gets a line in the entire court scene. So. I, if, yeah. I I mean, what do you imagine his defense would be? Um, she won't let me say anything, nor will she tell me <laughs> what's going on, Your Honor. Uh, in her defense, uh, she's won't let me talk. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, All right. It's time to go into a weird segment of the show, which is always kind of weird in our show when we talk about film straight adaptations. But it's where we compare our opinions to those of the critics when this came out. It's time for Breviews. It's time for Breviews. It's time for Breviews. Now, Adam, have you ever read, like, actual proper reviews of this movie? No. Okay, this is going to be fun. (laughs) All right. Um, Bri- it? No, um, <laughs> it's going to be a weird <laughs> mix. Um, so, Bree, you're going to take this first one, and I'll take the second one from Roger Ebert, because I, I, I love Roger Ebert's crazy way of writing. Okay, sounds good. 
Also, right. you didn't say reviews like you normally oh, do. Oh, you're right. I reviews. <laughs> That's my go. favorite part every week. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so we have one from Kenneth Tura. Is yep. that how? Is that him? Yep. Okay. Cool. All right, so LA Times top critic Kenneth Tura said Lars von T- v- Lars von <laughs> <laughs> Lars von Trier. We're already <laughs> there. We got there. We're, We're already, already there. It already. I'm already killing the pronouncing <laughs> pronouncing <laughs> Trier. names. Trier, like Greer, the cheese. Yeah. That's gonna be my cheese rating. No one take that. Mm-hmm. No, I won't take it. Lars von Greer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Lars von Trier's Dancer in the Dark. Uh, the most morose, morose of musicals is exasperating in its contradiction, so frustrating in its fakery, so deeply irritating in its pretensions, is frankly hard to know where to begin to dissect it. Um, the only... Wow. Yeah, that's pretty rough, right? Mm. <laughs> yeah, and this is like the morning after its premiere at Cannes. This isn't like with five years of hindsight. This is like fresh Fake, review the next day okay okay the only Continue. the only actor to survive two hours and 20 minutes of this tedium is bjork called on to carry a misery laden picture without any acting training to fall back on bjork by all reports had to more or less live selma's tortured life in to get it in to get it on film bjork was not Acting anything, she was feeling everything, is how Von Trier explained the process uh, in Cannes. And that made it extremely hard on herself and everyone else. In a musical, nothing dreadful ever happens, says Selma, during a break between the tortures of the damned. When I worked in the factory, I used to dream of being in a musical. After all she's been through, who has the heart to tell her she couldn't possibly stand the one she's in? I think that this guy just didn't get it, and I hate just being that dismissive, but I feel like he was caught in the mood. And have you ever read about what happened at the can screening, Adam? No. What happened? At the end, it was equal parts cheering and booing. It that's was like every sp- can premiere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, like, that's like why you go to can is they can boo. <laughs> Um, it's incredible, but I, I, yeah. I feel like he was like caught up in that wave of like, uh, I think I'm leaning negative where I can't imagine how I'd react to such a visceral film in an audience where it's just the tension is that tight. Have you ever seen this with like a full audience, Adam? Uh, no, I haven't. No. The closest I have is when they screamed it in one of my classes and just like mm-hmm. watching the rest of the room was an incredible experience. And that was like my fifth time seeing it. So it was like, oh, yeah? uh, I'm not even watching the movie at this point. <laughs> Did a lot of them hate it? Yeah, like a lot of like them were just too emotional. Like, why did we watch this? And the teacher was mm. very much like, this is to show you verite style. This is to show you like that not everything needs to be shot. It was a great teacher, great, wonderful teacher mm. of cinematography that was just showing different cinema styles. And it doesn't all have to look like Roger Deakins to be an effective yeah. story, which is great. But you could have shown a Sean Baker film and done the same thing without torturing us. <laughs> Like, very, <laughs> yeah. um, he couldn't have uh, traumatized us and gave us that same lesson. Um, it, it was great to watch other people's reaction, but you could cut the tension in that room with a knife. That's great. Um, the next day we watched Crash, so it, it, oh. there was a very mixed bag in that, in that class, I'll say that. But which one? Um, the bad one. <laughs> okay. The one that won Best Picture. You know, the bad yeah. one. Yeah. Um, All right, now I'm going to read the Roger Ebert review from that same screening the next day, which is... I've also cut out the part where he just randomly calls characters, like, by the R slur, which was weird, so it's truncated quite a bit. Oh, does he? Yeah, he calls Peter Stormare's character um, the the R slur. That's that's hilarious, okay. It was just a nice thing to say. Um, You you nailed it, Ebert. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he's not always the most, most cautious about those things so he said some reasonable people will admire Lars von Trier's dancer in the dark and others will despise it an excellent case can be made for both positions the first press screening at Cannes was at 8 30 a.m after the screening the auditorium filled with booing and cheering so equal in measure that people started booing or cheering at each other as well (laughs) 
I sat in my seat ready to cheer or boo when I made up my mind. I left the movie Marinate and saw it again and was able to see what Von Trier was trying to do. Having made a vow of chastity with his favorite famous Dogma 95 statement, which calls for films to be made simply with handheld cameras and available light, he is now divesting himself of modern fashions and plotting. Dance in the Dark is a brave throwback to the fundamentals of the cinema to, to heroines and villains, noble sacrifices and dastardly betrayals. The relatively crude visual look underlines the movie's abandonment of slick modernism, which I completely agree with. I feel like mm-hmm. Ebert got it. And I think he, him being like, I think I need to see this again before writing down what I think is smart. And I think most critics should do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he could have done that with the taste of cherry, but whatever. <laughs> uh, it's all right. He's not doing much anymore anyways. <laughs> oh, yeah. Where has he been? He'll come back in, uh, after his long hiatus, right? <laughs> you know what? He just had too much of the YouTube drama and decided to step oh, yeah. back for a while. He got he got canceled on Twitter, but... <laughs> well, I'm saying the we'll R-slur in the Dancer in the Dark review? Yeah. Uh, we're gonna, yeah, we're getting to cancel him the second time. Let's, let's get this... Spread the word. Get this out there. Yeah, yeah. Cancel Roger Ebert. Um, he didn't like um, Rent, so cancel him. Hmm. Oh, that'll that'll get our audience going. Fun fact: that was something <laughs> like that people at the time were really angry about for no reason. Was the fact that he gave a thumbs up or gave a positive review on the show, but gave a negative review on his website for the movie Rent, and like everyone in the community oh, was just really ticked off. That's hilarious. But the movie Rent isn't good. So no, I mean, he's no, right. no, it isn't. No, it is very bad. <laughs> <laughs> but people oh, well. on the internet are insane, even back then. On that positive note. On that positive <laughs> note, um, let's go into a mid-show announcement and get some money. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt you in the middle of the show, but we've got a shill at you. Today's show is brought to you by the extremely kind donations by our donors over at Patreon. In case you don't know, Patreon is a place where you get free shit from us. Uh, well, not free, you paid for it monthly, kind of. Andrew, what do we have up there? Oh boy, well we just... Uh... Put out some new um, commentaries on musical theater fails and blunders, bloopers, I suppose you'd call them. Uh, and Trailer some reactions, stuff. a bunch of crap. Trailer reactions. I mean, we're going to have some more stuff up there, too. Mm-hmm. We're, we're trying to get to it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but who's supporting us currently? Well, our current patrons are Melissa Goldman, Terry Needleman, John Donna, Ter- Late the Ackles, um, Danielle Renix, Jessica Stampede, Ewan Cassidy, Taskier, Fire September, Monica Thoreau, Mina Maniri, Brent Black, Haley Murray, B Wayflix, Nathaniel Stacey Coombe, Joseph Evans Green, Carrie Ahern, Christine Malmedal, Mary Lou Choquette, John Vanals, Heck You, I Go by Elijah Now, Russ Walker, Musical Hell, Mi- Emily Gracie, Andrew Van Barson. Double M, Kyle Summers, Janae C, Christina Francis, Scoot and the Technicolor Dreamcoat, Liz Lim, Corey Wilmarth, Allison Stellar, Nothing is Certain Except Beth and Taxes, John Vanals, Thesbian, Ren Cullen, Wait in the Wings, Lady Malvolia, Spectacle Machine, Jacob Stroop, Raphael M- Martinez Salaz, uh, Robert Benjamin, Rachel T, Jessica T, Genevieve Hartnett, Cass, Michelle Young, Chai T, Cup Hayden Wilder, Katie McDonough, Genki Guy Stackis. Timothy Keys, Jeffrey Machado, Jacqueline Spring, Toon Van Essen, Jesse Taylor, and that's it. And these give us a little these folks give us a little extra financial support that helps us keep the lights on here at Musicals and Cheese. If you'd like to join them in supporting us and get tons of fun perks such as patron only commentaries our episodes a day earlier, even earlier, come join us over at Patreon. Also, we've got a ton of merch on our merch store. Just go to musicalswithcheese.com and click the merch button. All right, let's get back to it. <laughs> talk about the overture of this this movie first and foremost which is so incredible so like teasing of other things and also just very weird when it pops up in a bunch of other things because it's basically treated as a pop song at this point 
Um, I remember it being in a Michael Moore documentary, um, the one about oh. like other countries being better than America, and then just when he's like wrapping up his thesis statement, I'm like, is that is that fucking Dancer in the Dark you're playing at the oh, end interesting. there? Yeah, it is. Uh, it's one of my favorite parts pieces of music, honestly, mm-hmm. in the movie. Um, I wish more of the music was like that because it does kind yes. of like imply this more uh, formal, traditional musical kind of style to it that I think really could have worked, uh, but that it wouldn't really be Bjork music anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, so most of it had to be yeah. weird. But then at the end credits of the movie, there's kind of like a nice combination of the two. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I don't know. I, I, I mean, like the string an, instruments a lot. So. I, I completely agree. It is one of the most big feeling. And for an overture, it is weird that it only kind of sets up the finale, which I find very fascinating, but also very effective. Mm-hmm. What do we think about like I... the visual style of the opening credits? Because I remember that kind of both engaging me and throwing me off. I I didn't get it right away, but uh, after learning the plot, I feel like it's... Is it meant to imply going blind, almost, is is my thought? Because like, uh... visually, it, it's hard to tell what it's, what's happening, and they kind of fade and crossfade re- really slowly between things. I don't know. I'm willing to bet money that it's there because Lars von Trier thought it looked cool. Um, he does. <laughs> That's, he, I might he be likes, reading more into it than needed. Then he really <laughs> likes the the painted titles um, and like you know intro cards and stuff. Like he he does a lot of this in a bunch of his movies. Um, yeah, so it's not this. This isn't like an outlier or anything. So I wouldn't read too much into it. Okay, but it I, I had a cool explanation and everything. I th- I thought it was that. I... <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, mean st- I, think I might looks... be wrong. My my perspective doesn't invalidate yours. That is, yeah. I um, I say it does. You know, what? I, Andrew, your your opinion is invalidated now. Just shut your Got fucking him. mouth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I uh, I did actually like it though. I was a little confused at first, but I guess my post hoc exclamation uh, fixed it in my own mind. So I'm gonna keep it. I mean, I think that's. <laughs> not a bad way to view it because I remember oh what was it is it a Jim Jarmusch film the blue blue where it's just nothing but the color blue for the entire time because he was going blind due to AIDS and that's kind of the color he saw so there is a justification maybe mm. I'm gonna pretend I'm gonna pretend I liked it I, I don't... it hurt my eyes though a little bit <laughs> I was trying to read words and, and something because it looked like there might have been words, but there definitely wasn't any words. <laughs> All right. That's good. All right. Let's go on to the next song. Um, Kvalda, um, which is her friend's name, correct? It's what she calls her friend. Okay. It's not actually her name. Uh, this is the song in the factory, right? Correct. The, the clang, crash, boom, whatever. Mm-hmm. Yes, the most Bjork song ever Bjorked. I like the music style. I know it's kind of just Bjork songs, but I think it's interesting. You don't hear much of it in music theaters, so it's different. I don't know. I mean, it doesn't mm-hmm. feel like they're trying to sell you something. This isn't just like... Um, A Star is Born, where it's just like, buy this Lady Gaga album that is also the soundtrack of this film, where this is literally just a Bjork album that is the soundtrack. It doesn't feel that way. It feels like, yeah, that would be kind of how this character would interpret it. I also like that the noise that is integrated into the song is the noise that is always whenever they're in the factory, even like well before it and after that, that it's always that same rhythmic style. Yeah, it teases it beforehand, and on second watches, you can 
definitely pick up like, oh, that's just the song right now, even yeah. though we're not getting into it yet, you know, early on in the film. Mm-hmm. It's those yeah. little teases. Um, visually, like the way that they kind of turn this like gray looking thing and that without really affecting the colors are bringing in like mise-en-scene, like different variations kind of make it feel more alive. Um, that is a strange choice where literally they will change nothing about the production design to try to make it more musical. They will literally only change the way it is shot as well as the color correction to imply fantasy musical segment. But I think it works. I think it works really I mean, well. Everyone also starts dancing. I mean, I don't know if you picked up on that. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll have to watch it again. That, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that is fair. Um, I think also aside from Joel Gray, um, the woman that plays Quelda, Quelda, is the best singer outright aside from Bjork and Joel Gray. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, lots of energy. <laughs> I liked, I like this track. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, like, I don't know. I, I, I do like the music in it, but I still, still wish it was something a bit different. I feel like I feel like the full potential of this film could have been realized if it was a little less B- Bjorky sounding. <laughs> so let's say hypothetically they keep Bjork in the lead role, keep her voice, and they bring in like a Mark sure. Shaman or someone that can like replicate like real intense yeah, original sure. Broadway. Yeah, I don't have any issues with her voice at all. Um, all my favorite artists pretty much have like really weird, distinct voices. Uh, all the favorite singers that I listen mm-hmm. to. Uh, it's just the style of the music itself that I find to be like a little clashing and yeah, you can justify it because her character's weird and they say at the beginning that she's, you know, has weird ideas about music and you know, they, her, she, the way she sings is different and blah, 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 blah. Like, yeah, it's justified in the film's universe, but I'm just saying like personally from my own perspective of what I would want out of it, I feel like there was, there was a lot untapped in terms of how emotionally powerful a song could be, especially with this universe and story, mm-hmm. I feel like there. Do you been have more like a it. specific like composer sound or even like kind of movie sound you have in mind for like um, your ultimate oh version? Man, I, well, I mean, like the the overture at the beginning, like if it was more mm-hmm. like that, or even like the end credits, um, you know, like it's it's touching on what I would want. I would like it to sound a bit more orchestral. Um, you know, it, it doesn't. It's difficult. It's difficult to to describe, but I just hmm. uh, feel like it's a bit conflicting for my own personal taste. I feel like I because if I'm like if I'm thinking about the most bit. emotional parts of the movie, I'm not mm-hmm. thinking about any song. I'm not thinking about any scene during a song, except for maybe the end when it was just her voice, right? Like those are yeah. the most emotion. The most emotional parts of the movie are like to do with the core plot elements of like the betrayal and how she sacrificed everything for her son and like the police officer using his power and taking advantage of her and. Um, how she is given a way out and winds up doing the right thing anyway because she's like she sacrificed everything and then her hanging at the end. Those are all the most emotionally powerful parts of the film. But in a musical, I should also be thinking about the songs as being the most emotionally powerful parts, but they're Mm. not. And sure, the songs are good. Like there's some catchiness to them. They're not terrible songs. They're very Bjorky. A lot of people love Bjork. But at no point in the actual songs in this musical that, you know, are, are taking place during these emotional scenes and flat beats, at no point am I really feeling the full potential of what music could offer in one of those scenes. And I love the movie. I'm just like, it's. Mm. I feel like it's. there's some potential that wasn't fully realized. I think in a few of the songs, I disagree that it shouldn't be. I, I like the industrial feel of it because mm-hmm. she is imagining the music from industrial instruments, essentially. Mm -hmm. So I feel like the way they do that, it kind of works, at least in a few of the songs. Though, I think part of the reason the music isn't as memorable in these emotional parts is because they don't put the music in the emotional scenes. You know, like there's there's no song... To some extent. During those... I mean... Yeah, I don't know if I fully agree with that, but you, I, I'm not saying you have to kill any of the industrial sounds, even. Um, I, I guess, I guess part of what my I guess disagreement here would have to just be like in terms of like the chord progression like what are you communicating emotionally with that um that clacker crash bang thing like the chorus of that obviously a lot of energy a lot of like happiness we feel um that this is like this musical world that she's living in but then you get into the verse and it's just like this weird like kind of like mysterious like uh yeah and it's like what am I getting from that emotionally and again like with the uh you just did like that's so weird. I don't know. 
Like, I agree it, with that one because the melody uh, in that one is just wacky. I don't, I don't know. I would write it differently. <laughs> is all I'm saying. Maybe I mean I kind of see what you're saying, but maybe if Bjork was the one performing those elements, both those elements are the ones that are decidedly not performed by Bjork. Mm. Maybe so, she's the only one that could pull it off. I mean, I don't know. It, it would. It is obviously very jarring anytime anyone else is singing that isn't Bjork. Um, it's sometimes they pull it off pretty well, but it is often that doesn't quite feel right to the ear. Yeah, yeah. So. I, I see what you're saying, and I agree. I, I would love a more orchestral score to this, um, but I feel like there there is the fight push and pull fight of like there has to be a tri- real world trigger auditory for every song. I think that is the truth for all of them. I don't. I don't think fa- you have to get rid of that. I think you can still incorporate those things. Mm-hmm. I don't think that those are mutually exclusive. So what you'd want is keep the industrial style beats, but incorporate strings you can yeah i mean like yeah you incorporate more strings yeah you can do that have less weird chord progressions and time signatures like i'm not trying to i'm not trying to say like oh you can't do any weird or interesting things i'm just saying like there are parts in the movie where i would like to be feeling the raw emotions of something but instead i'm just going oh this is interesting and weird you know like (laughs) yeah what it's driving my mind towards and i would prefer to get the full experience of what narratively i should be getting out of the scene yeah no i mean i agree with that actually especially in the more like after she kills the guy that song especially should just be more straightforward um and then yeah. even like the ending like the 107 steps like that song is like what is even going on i don't know i mean i don't that, mind that, that one. one there's not a lot going on in that one right? not a lot yeah but it's building up to something and i, I don't really know if it builds up very well I mean, I it's a countdown, so to say. It, it, it That one works in a way where it kind of is. I am so flippin' curious to Adam's opinion on, like, Bjork's, like, soundtrack version of this, where she masters all of them, because there is much more orchestral elements added in. Um, yeah, especially... I, I've never heard it. Why didn't they use that in the movie, Because I though? feel like Lars von Trier, A, had a budget, B, like, had a, has this aesthetic that that probably did not fit into as much as that and like probably Bjork was worried too much about acting and performing and like writing these songs that she didn't quite get a chance to get all of her like songwriting people involved in mastering it the way that she has without any outside elements bring yeah I I honestly would have just assumed that if I bought a soundtrack for the film, it would have been the same shit. I had no idea it was. No, it is not. In yeah. Sometimes it's for the better. Sometimes it's for the okay. worst. Yeah, I'm very curious um, about it. I'll check it out later. It does bother me a bit, like that I don't have a soundtrack of the movie to, that you can buy. You just have this yeah. Selma songs Weird. album that Bjork made. Interesting. Hmm. Um, hmm. But I do want to talk briefly about I've seen it all. Um, the Oscar nominated song from this. Um, but she sang that song wearing the swan dress um, at the Oscars, and it was a moment, and she did a very good job with that song. Um, I think the orchestration, even as she performed it live, was better than what was in the movie. Um, I think it's one of the better songs in the show, and one of the ones that is actually a reaction to plot points in a way where it feels yeah. like a proper musical number. It seems the most fitting in terms of, like, the, my earlier criticisms about the weird tones and sounds. Uh, it seems like this, you know, it still incorporates the, the train uh, sounds. Yep. And 
uh, there's a lot of musical elements in it that, that are more traditional and it's able to do both and it feels like it fits properly. Mm-hmm. I'm going to, I think this is the best song in the show or the one that I remember the most yeah. at the very least. <laughs> I, I do want to talk about musical theater structure just to try to frame this thing that is definitely not written as musical theater structure it into it. It doesn't fit music theater it structure does, though. at all. But... It does. Oh, you, go off. You've got the overture, which sets up the themes, like, in theory. Uh, Faldo, which sets up the rules of the world, um, what she does for a living, and how she escapes. Technically, that sets up the world in the same way as like tradition from o- or from Fiddler on the Roof. Like it is effective. And then I've seen it all as the I Want song, mm-hmm. where she's saying where you I don't get... want. Well, an I Want song just basically says goals yeah. and opinion. Yeah, <laughs> like what is going to set us on the road. Yeah, mm-hmm. it happens more than an hour in, but structurally, <laughs> it's sound. And then we have our 11 o'clock number, which is next to last song. And then we have New World mm-hmm. that wraps it all up. This is a musical theater structure, whether they intended it or not. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe they did intend it. I mean, yeah. I'm sure when they wrote the songs, they didn't expect it to be an hour in when they get to that first one, but... Mm-hmm. So Who knows? here's an argument. Why why not have Claude be like the first time we see her in the factory and she just ha- and move that song up so we kind of set up the non diegetic singing a little earlier. I think it's less uh, impactful if you do it that way. I don't mm-hmm. know. I like I like that it delays it. I like that it lets you soak up the characters and narrative mm-hmm. a bit before getting into that it makes it more jarring i mean i was about That's an hour though. in i'm like wait is there is there even any <laughs> more me. is there even any more any songs in this no i mean i i, I agree yeah. I, I was like an hour in though and i'm like is it was is this a musical or is it just about musicals and then then they start singing and it's like oh okay and i am <laughs> not in any way suggesting it is better be, to do that i'm just like in theory could we do that and would it change anything for negative or positive so you're, when you're saying, when we move it to the stage, which we're, of course, going to do yeah, at so some we, point. If Bjork and Lars von Trier decide they want to collaborate mm. with Julie Taymor to turn this into a stage musical. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, then you move Kelda to the beginning. And <laughs> Bjork, Bjork writes ten more songs, and it's just as nightmare-inducing as usual. Mm. I Man, think they did do a the uh, stage version of it. Really? Yeah, did I have they? a DVD that I haven't watched. Um, I don't know who did it. Un- unmarked. But I definitely have a DVD that I picked up not too long ago. Oh my god, I would watch I don't know the how hell out of that. I found it on eBay, I think. But I was like, Cause, yeah, I'll watch this. Because <laughs> this is basically a play. It's mostly dialogue-based except for the song number. Like, this would translate fairly well. I don't see why you would do it, but it would translate in theory. There's not, like, uh-huh. anything. Like, Andrew, it goes by your rule that all musicals end in a court case. Like, literally, that is your... Well, it doesn't end in the court case, so that's more like halfway. Yeah. Well, two-thirds in because... It ends in in something better than a court case, an execution. Yeah, yeah, just just like Parade. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, it's it, it's Parade. It, it, yeah, I guess they don't need to bring this to Broadway. Parade already exists. <laughs> um, I mean, let's similar. Let's talk about the in the musicals scene, both of them really quick. <laughs> Well, 
Well, they just split one song into two different scenes, basically. Well, yeah, but they also kind of change the instrumentation and the way that it, the f- vibe and you've got a duet going on and a dance break. I feel like you don't need the first one, but I'm happy it's there. <laughs> I had weird feelings about it, especially this time, and I feel like I felt this way watching it many different times. But if I'm supposed to believe that her... If I'm supposed to believe that the musical scenes that we're seeing are a representation of her escapism from the, uh, you know, mundane aspects of her life, how uh, she's doing all these things for her son and uh, putting her into a, a state of mind where she needs to escape at the factory, blah, blah, blah. It all makes sense up until that scene where she's escaping from watching the musical that she supposedly wants to be watching and starts thinking of other music. Where it's like that narrative yeah. just seems so weird because like mm-hmm. I thought I thought that that was your escapism, but now you're escaping from something that every moment of this movie is is saying that you actually like. So why are you why why the escapism when that's how they got her to stay there was like oh we'll show you the new drummer that we got. So why is she daydreaming then if she likes seeing it? So I don't I don't know if I like she, it being there. The second I don't like escaping it, from her own room. I like but yeah. Maybe she's escaping from her own guilt, like emotions and guilt. But she wasn't I, thinking. Why that's not why they escape got her to in... stay? Was she was like the yeah? Why not thing, escape right? into the music that's actually playing? Right? Why, yeah, why make it up your make own any song? Sense narratively. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, but I, I've I never mean, been like dis- it's, it's at the service of her saying they'll always be there to catch me, and then she gets caught. Mm-hmm. Right? Like that was the then she, that's, yeah. that's what it's a pun. It was made <laughs> to. to that, that's why they put it there, is just for that moment. And that's a good moment, but man, if if they would have structured it around differently and like, let's say the uh, stage director was like, oh no, just stay here for a minute. I promise we'll show you this later. And then she had to sit there doing nothing for like a minute and then mm-hmm. it turned into that escapism. That would have, you know, you would have had the exact same moment at the end, uh, but it would have been a bit more narratively justified, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. But also, I, the, the second one is just so good. The second one is like the best oh, yeah. scene in the entire movie for me, <laughs> in yeah, like, like twenty it. different well, outside ways. Outside of it being very strange that they got this tap dancer to fly over to this court case, but other than that, <laughs> I mean, it's fun. You, you got the tapping scene on the desk. I mean, it's that's a fun number. I mean, yes, but also like all the extras are into it and well choreographed, whereas like the choreography and all the other scenes is dubious to like bad. Um, I think <laughs> the choreography is actually good and I've seen it all just shot terribly. <laughs> like yeah. where you got all the dancers on the train and I'm like, that's such a cool idea, dancing on a train. And then he just shot it badly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this mm-hmm. like every single person is on point. Every cut is driven and it fe- feeds the momentum. And I feel like this is, this thing followed are the only two like ones where the momentum builds with the edits and it doesn't become quite as chaotic as Falda, but it does. It feels right. It feels correct. And you've got that. And that is the last bit of happiness we got. And then we have 107 steps, which is a great rhythmic piece. Um, wonderful noise soundscape. But I get what you're saying, Andrew, of, oh, it's just counting. 30. I like yeah. it. I don't have any real I didn't issues dis- with it. Like it. I just I felt like it could build more uh with I don't know, that or be more dark, mm-hmm. but well, I guess maybe you don't need more the darkness at that moment. The juxtaposition of like what's happening with how bright the song sounds makes it much more surreal. I feel like if you made it more dark it would be a hat on a hat. Yeah. You're probably yeah, I right. I don't I don't have any issues with this this one at all. I um, also want to give credit to the character actor that plays the prison guard that walks her down. Um, like, I watched her and I'm like, I know I've seen her somewhere. And I know she's mm-hmm. like a Zemeckis favorite where she's like in a oh, bunch yeah. of Zemeckis films. She's most notably like the bus driver from Forrest Gump. But she's like mm-hmm. incredible in these final scenes. Like, absolutely. Oh, yeah, she's incredible. great. She's a very necessary character in the mm-hmm. film, I feel. Yeah. 
to get the right emotions like, across. It's such a complex role she has to play where she's trying to help this woman walk to her death that she cares about a lot and like trying to defend her right to like be hung without a bag over her head. Like what yeah. she's fighting for are the like the most fucked up things you could think about being at, as a human being. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um <laughs> <laughs> So and new, then if this next song doesn't break you, then I mean you're just not you have no emotions. <laughs> next to last song, a new world. Like I feel like they're hand in hand together. live singing like the one time i think in the entire show aside from like the, yeah when the dog bites and True. all that where she's singing live um the one time it's truly diegetic within the world and the most painful song to listen to yeah no issues with it at all love it works works really well for yeah. what it's doing um great reincorporation about you know how she wanted to like walk out of the theater in the second to last song so that it's always playing forever and i love how that's tied back into this um mm -hmm. yeah great but nothing no issues with these last ones at all i think that whew, i i get andrew andrew brought up to me before that he thought it was a little cheap that she just runs up to her and gives the glasses to her like oh your son he's okay <laughs> Wait, everything's good it feels good. like they wanted to tack on that she gets some sort of some sort of happy ending and I kind of get that, but... I love I that moment. Um, and it wouldn't be, like, the most illogical thing in the film. So. No, I mean, there's more. Uh, yeah. I guess after being punched in the gut for two and a half hours, I was like, man, that was weird that they tried to give me a lollipop. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not even, like, a happy moment. It's, like, really bittersweet, too, you know? I feel it, like it really I get, is. I feel like I I get more emotional from that than it's it's not it like is, to dampen it, it, the emotions. It's not to make you feel better, really. I don't know. And it is what triggers the last song because I don't think she would have sang the last song if that didn't happen. So, yeah. Um, or the the next to last song. Pardon. Me. I want to say a th my first watch, which was probably an incorrect interpretation, was that that character had lied. And just because a she waits until literally the last moment she can to just say this to her, and she just kind of all she has is the glasses. And I'm like, what if she's just lying to try to like make her friend feel good in the last moment? Because a she didn't have all the money together for the surgery, and I don't believe like the doctor would just be like, eh, that's enough. We're America. Mm -hmm. We. Um, so part of me is like, what if she just lied to kind of like calm her down and make it go easier? But maybe kinda, I'm wrong in that interpretation. That's possible. Although, honestly, I feel like that makes it, like, worse. At least give her the happy ending if you're going to do that. I mean, <laughs> the, the thing is, we don't see the kid again. The kid is barely a character in this. He's a plot device to get her through a lot of torture. Mm -hmm. True. Which yeah, is fine a, and it works. There's possibilities for anything if it's not explicitly shown in the movie. What if the police officer's still alive and it was all just a really elaborate prank? And that is a great got prank. Got him. All right, let's wrap this on up. So everyone, what is our overall thoughts on Dance in the Dark and our cheese rating? Um, I'm going to make Andrew go first just so Adam gets the pointless thing of sure. the cheese rating. <laughs> oh, uh, sure. Jeez, oh, what am I even... Okay, well, as far as the movie goes, uh, I don't know. I, I, I really liked it. It I watched it yesterday and I'm still getting over it. It's uh, it's really well done. Uh, if you like heavy movies, uh, you will enjoy. Uh, if you don't, probably don't watch it. But yeah, 
As far as a, a cheese rating, oh boy. So we're supposed to pick a cheese that is like how you feel. Literally, it's just there's... us kind of making fun of ratings at the end of okay. like videos and podcasts. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I can give a cheese that makes is is this powerful. <laughs> I don't know. I'll give it like a like, Do I give anything pepper jack? I'm going to give never it that. given a pepper jack before. There you go. And this it, it hurts it hurts your mouth but you still enjoy it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that is fair. All right, Adam, do you think you're ready? Um Sure. Yeah. Love the movie. Uh, one of my favorites uh, from Lars von Trier for sure. Uh, that and Antichrist. There are some ways that it could be improved, uh, but I mean, overall, it's generally what it tries to do. It succeeds at doing. Uh, very powerful and emotional. Um, yeah, very well made overall. And I'm giving this uh, camel's milk cheese. <laughs> I, I I I love it. <laughs> I, love I don't it. even need a reason. I, I get yeah. it. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that feels perfect. Um, so, Bree, how did you like our discussion and your cheese rating on that? You know, I really enjoyed this discussion. I um, I feel like sometimes you guys don't typically sell me on a movie or um, a musical, but this one I feel like you guys really sold me. I love the fact that this has that it was so like emotionally impactful, especially on Andrew. Um, <laughs> Like, this one hurt me, okay? Like I, I'm an emotional guy. This hurt. I should have shot it's you a painful... text to be like, yo, this film this film will not make you feel good. Yeah, I mean I like that kind of stuff, but you know, it doesn't it does impact oh. pretty well and I, I didn't know what to expect. But I love that. I, I love a movie that will make you feel something, uh, even if it is uh sadness. Um, so I said my cheese rating earlier and I didn't want to do any research. So we're going with Lars, Lars. von Greer. <laughs> <laughs> Great. That, that <laughs> might be it. one of your best cheese ratings yet. Um, it's yeah. also probably the only time we can use that pun on the show. So we will job. never review another <laughs> Lars von Trier film. I don't think we'll, he's, unless he's going to do cats. Another musical. Hmm. <laughs> and if so, I would happily go see it. I hope him and Bjork men bridges. I doubt they will. <laughs> Um, yeah, doesn't doesn't seem like that will happen. No, but. never in a thousand years. <laughs> um, but my cheese rating is Mainland Special Reserved Creamery Kember Cheese um, from New World Creamery um, because there is a song in this show called New World. Very awesome. well researched. You did a great job. I give myself a C minus. <laughs> Adam, thank you so much C for plus. being on the show. You were thank great. You. you brought so much like intelligence to a very dumb show that we usually do we appreciate that um all promote all your stuff tell everyone where they can find you uh i have a youtube channel it's called your movie sucks uh i trash movies but i also recommend movies uh type yms it'll be the first thing there i also have a gaming channel adam plays it's spelt weird a d u m p l a z e i also make music uh my artist name is an unkindness a n space U-N-K-I-N-D-N-E-S-S. Uh, I just released an album last year all by myself. Very, very independent. Um, I have a podcast called Sardonicast. We talk about movies. We also talked about Dancer in the Dark on a previous episode that Anthony Fantano joined for. That's one of the first episodes Ooh. we did. And uh, I don't know. What else? Nothing. All right. <laughs> um, whenever we have guests, I like to give like a personal recommendation of one of their videos. Um, so... I think your Kimba video is one of the most well-researched video essays to ever exist. And uh, Thank you. it is a lot to kind of dive into. It is a very long video. So if you're into that, go for that. But if you want to back up like goofed your video, Cool Cat videos are fantastic. Yeah, those are older though. Kimba is newer. And I've, I've listened to that at least twice. That's really good. I one. mean, I remember watching it the first week it came out and being like, I got to watch that again. I got I to gotta start that one from the beginning. This is a long road awesome. to find out whether or not it was a ripoff. <laughs> yeah, it was necessary. I killed 100%. it. 100%. Um, you know who else killed it? 
our wonderful patrons. Thank you for listening. Um, please follow us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, at Musicals with Cheese. We're on Twitter, at Cheesy Musicals, Patreon Musicals with Cheese, Instagram Musicals with Cheese, and YouTube page Musicals with Cheese. We have a patron-only podcast called Patreon with Cheese, where you get to hear us talk about Galavant at the moment, but I think we're going to move on to the Tangled animated series after that. Um, email us at musicaltheaterlives at gmail.com. Our title card was created by the amazing Jolene Casco. Go send her some love at Jolene Casco on Instagram. Our keeper of the cheese is Juliet Antonio. Thank Thank you for doing that. This show is produced by the absolutely wonderful, the incredible, my best friend in the world, Brianna Jones. Thank you, Bree. <laughs> Our theme song for Bree Views was created by Robin Nash of IOU Music UK. Thank you to the Broadway Podcast Network for having us on the platform and for not kicking us off yet for talking about yeah. Lars von Trier depressing depression porn. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, is there anything else you want to say before we wrap this up? Uh... Synecdoche, New York. We're all <laughs> we're all hurtling towards death. <laughs> it's the movie itself it's didn't depress true. you. It's <laughs> true. Oh, sorry. We, he's well, right. You put me on the spot. Wow. I had to think of something. <laughs> Wow! Did you I'm guys sorry. know that we're all going to be dead someday? Oh, yeah. thank and the Earth God! Will be in a black hole. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> so you can Hopefully, it's watch like by execution before you're dead. Before you take your 107 steps. All yeah. right, guys. Yeah, we'll see you that. next time <laughs> on Musicals with Cheese. Bye-bye. I've seen it all. There is nothing to see.